Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats. And uh, this is a very special afternoon. Uh, it is uh, our pleasure and honor to welcome Mark Thompson, uh, the CEO of the New York Times and the former Director General of the BBC, and a few other things. But uh, uh, this is all on behalf of the Václav Havel Library. Uh, I'm Michal Jantowski, the Executive Director, and uh, we owe our thanks to the Secura Foundation who helped to sponsor and organize <coughs> this event. And I will now give over to Václav Štětka, uh, the uh, well-known media expert and scholar, who will introduce our stellar panel. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is, uh, is what I already mentioned, is Václav Štěvka. I teach and do research on media and communication at Loughborough University in England. And uh, I would like to welcome you all uh, to tonight's debate with Mark Thompson, uh, President and CEO of the New York Times, who will be joined by uh, three more panelists, uh, who am I going to introduce in a short moment. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to uh, extend the thank you to another institution which participated in the organization of this event, apart from Secretary Foundation and the Václav Havel Library. It was also the Center for Philosophy, Ethics and Religion. So thank you to all the organizers for making this event uh, possible. Uh, the title for tonight's debate is Journalism and Democracy in the Age of Polarization. In both the US and in Europe, including and particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, the words journalism and democracy have in the last several years been mentioned increasingly in a context that suggests that there is something about the current state and mutual relationship that we should be deeply concerned about. Journalism, especially the kind of, that is practiced by legacy news organizations, has been undergoing a very difficult period of transition into the digital age, struggling to survive uh, in an environment where uh, the majority of advertising revenues are swallowed by global digital platforms. Democratic institutions have been under attack from populist politicians and authoritarian leaders, and these attacks have uh, often been directed at mainstream media, seeking to undermine their credibility and public trust, uh, in many cases, uh, unfortunately, quite successfully. Recent events, such as the election of Donald Trump, Brexit, or the last presidential election in the Czech Republic, indeed, have exposed deepening polarization of uh, our contemporary societies, a process which has uh, often been associated with the impact of the internet and social media. So what is the future for journalism and democracy under these difficult circumstances, and where to look for hope and uh, inspiration in such turbulent times? These are among the questions that will be framing our tonight's debate, and we are extremely fortunate to have here as the main speaker a man who is particularly well positioned to speak about these matters, because both of his exceptionally rich professional experience in the field of journalism, spanning over 40 years, and across all the career ranks, as well as because of his current position as the chief executive officer of a news organization that has become one of the very symbols of this polarized public sphere because it's simultaneously being praised and acclaimed for its persisting efforts in defense of democracy and liberal values and at the same time loathed and smeared as fake news by those for whom such values apparently are a thorn in their side. Mark Thompson has been a president and CEO of the New York Times since 2012 and under his leadership, the New York Times became a global success story, having secured almost 3 million digital subscribers so far, more than any other news organization. He served as a director general of the BBC for eight years, and prior to that, uh, he was chief executive of Channel 4. He's author of a book titled Enough Set, What's Gone Wrong with the Language of Politics, published in 2016. Mark, welcome to Prague. So what an honour to be in this library. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to, to, to the library and indeed to, to this event. Um, 
Uh, um, I'm going to try and move pretty quickly and just try and present a kind of provocation. I mean, you've heard that I wrote um, a book about a kind of crisis in political language and a crisis in the relationship between politicians, the media and the public in 2016. I actually I had a drop dead deadline for the for the manuscript um, three days, the Sunday after the Friday when the Brexit result happened. So this is this is you know uh, uh, still three or four months before the Trump uh, election in in the U.S. and you know this is a book of you know nonfiction. Um, it's all true. I had this very weird experience of writing a book which was kind of full of frankly pretty troubled sort of foreboding about the future, and then it was like a novelist seeing the characters in their book come to life. Um, even as candidate Trump, I was writing about the way I thought Donald Trump was both rather effectively manipulating language. And um, just a few months later, I was having lunch with him um, at the New York Times. Um, and we've been living at the Times, and I know my friends at the BBC are, and I'd left the BBC by this point. We're living in the middle of this. Um, um, so I thought I might talk a little bit about, about um, what I thought a few years ago was happening and, and, and how it's playing out now. So, so um, a little bit about the, the, if you like, the thesis of the book, a little bit about populism and one or two kind of examples of the language of populism and the kind of puzzles and problems of the language and then a little bit about media, but I, I'll move quickly. So the thesis of the book basically was there's been this breakdown. Um, um, and so how did it happen? What, and I, I argue a number of different things came, came together. Um, um, there was definitely a kind of fatigue with the public language and the debate of the kind of post-war consensus, those decades. Um, technocracy, the sense of senior leaders and civil servants and economists and experts having their own uh, uh, language, their own way of doing their business, which didn't really pay much attention to ordinary people and which seemed to be a private club. The way in which um, started in America, ended up everywhere. Um, the, the intentional manipulation of, or attempted manipulation of the press through what became known as spin, the idea that, that sound bites and political statements would be carefully fashioned and spun to journalists. Uh, there would be an attempt to twist what journalists did, which left the journalists more and more cynical about politicians. Um, and what happened was the jur journalism and the coverage of politics got very negative. Politicians became very suspicious of the media. The public felt, felt more and more alienated. And other things were happening, other issues. There were some um, very big real-world events. There was, um, uh, in some countries, outrage at the Western wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. There was a sense um, that the 2008, uh, 2008 global financial crash that the people who've been responsible for that were never brought justice. And of course, globalization, automa um, automation, mass immigration, inequality, the sense of societies reaching further apart. And conventional politics didn't really have a language in which to capture this and hang on to ordinary people, or at least not to many ordinary people. And that's the vacuum into which populism went. And at the level of language, I mean, I think in a way, like so many things, if we go back in, in the past, this is the kind of stuff that occurs again and again in history. We go to the Roman Republic. There is, in some ways, the most beautiful, complex technocratic language, essentially legal language, probably of human history. Cicero is a master of subtle, sophisticated argument. But let's take another speaker, Julius Caesar. Caesar is a man of action. He gets things done. Uh, uh, he, he's a politician. He wants to be a dictator. He's a general. He has to leave Rome and fight his wars. Doesn't want the brand name to go unnoticed in Rome. So he writes uh, reports of his wars, which you can put up as posters on the corner of the street. Veni, vidi, vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. I'm a general. I, I'm not interested in these, the lawyer's talk. I'm not interested in all this complicated stuff. 
I'm going to cut through the crap. Now, the technical name for this is parataxis, very, very short sentences. It echoes down the years. Um, in, in Shakespeare, Shakespeare picks this up like everything perfectly. In the speech over the now dramatized Caesar's grave, Mark Antony says to the crowd, the crowd are wavering, he says, I am no orator as Brutus is, but as you know me, a plain blunt man. So I'm like you. I, Mark Antony, I look like a patrician. Actually, I'm one of you. I understand what you're feeling. We're really the same people. And I think if we jump forward, Silvio Berlusconi, if there's one thing I can't abide, it's rhetoric. All I care about is getting, th getting things done. And this is, if you like, the cry of the populace. They typically are CEOs now, they're business leaders or entrepreneurs. Uh, um, they're, they're not you know, typically military men, they, there are still some military men. But the idea of the, the, the man, it's, it's almost always a man, cutting through, the, cutting through the crap, keeping things simple, and those short sentences, you know, single syllables if you can do it. Donald Trump, walls work. Go to Israel. Talk to them about their wall. Walls work. We've got to build a wall, folks. We've got to build a wall. Ws, all those, the alliteration. That's very, alliteration is very typical. Right now, uh, Boris Johnson, new, new British Prime Minister. Um, what matters politically, domestically, to his base, delivering Brexit. Come what may. Um, it's going to be October the 31st, do or die alliteration, do or die. I would rather be dead in a ditch than not deliver Brexit. So this is where we are. It's a compression of complexity into a monosyllabic, super short sentence. Often they're laid together, that's how parataxis works, into a kind of crescendo to try and force your point across. This is only one example, but it's, I think it's quite a, quite a good one. And what I think is so interesting is it is getting tested now in government. Argu arguably, Matteo Salvini in Italy, another uh, practitioner, has struggled actually to make sense of that in the complexity of real government. And of course, having tried to call elections to, uh, to get political advantage, he's actually got knocked out. And uh, Cinque Stelle, the Five Star Movement, and the, and the uh, Italian uh, Social Democrats are now attempting another model, a kind of hybrid model of a traditional party and a, and a populist. Um, maybe it'll work in Italy. Um, but, um, but elsewhere... It's, it's very intriguing how it, 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 I'll take two examples. I'll take Trump and I'll take Johnson again. For, for Trump, Trump is finding it quite hard, I think, to articulate um, subtlety. And yet, real government calls for it. You know, your relationship uh, with North Korea changes subtly. It's quite a complex story, that story of the US and, and uh, um, uh, uh, and, and North Korea, but he, he can't do subtlety and he doesn't really try. Um, Donald attempts heroically to, um, to just get away with it. So one moment it's little, little, little rocket man and two weeks later it's, you know, we're very much in love with each other. He writes me these beautiful letters. He just flips to the other and he, he's quite capable of going back to the first if he needs to. Um, and the other thing that, that Donald's been doing since being president is rather than actually calling something, I'm going to do this, I'm not going to do that, because he has discovered that quite often you have to do the opposite. He quite often says things like, we'll have to see. You'll have to wait and see. It's like the end of a reality show, you know, uh, tune in next week. Something exciting. It's a bit of a mystery. I don't know what I'll do. I can't decide what my instincts will tell me. So keep watching. Uh, so rather than pinning it down. But I think Boris is, it's, it's interesting about Boris, because Boris, I think, the polls are rising, by the way, he, this, this, this stuff is, in the UK, is convincing, his, his lead over Labour is currently increasing significantly. So quite often, other, other countries' coverage of Brexit suggests that this is so absurd, um, it really can't be working. But the key thing about political language is, you know, Boris Johnson's not, trying to convince you guys, he's trying to convince his base in the UK, and for them, it's working pretty well. But the trouble that Boris, um, uh, or the risk that Boris faces is, 
what happens if he can't do it? What happens if he's forced uh, by the new law to go and ask for extension, an extension? Uh, uh, what happens if he gets into some other legal difficulty? What happens if he gets a kind of not very good deal uh, and then has to try and sell that to the company, like the deal he voted for back in March, by the way? Um, he hasn't really got an answer. It'll be very interesting to see how Boris tries to do that, given he's laid himself. I mean, these, these kind of super short, super clear sentences are a really good example of, if you like, a very, very high risk, very simple set of ideas. But you can, in government, you can get really get found out. So I think what's happening is we're beginning to discover that populism, which has been very effective as an opposition tool, it's been very effective as a, a way of criticizing the establishment, criticizing the existing political parties, criticizing the government. Again, Donald Trump, who's, who's bolder than everyone else, is continuing to attack parts of the federal government, even though he's the president and he's in charge of them. It, 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 Donald's quite happy to, to, to attack a, a, um, a government agency um, or to attack the chairman of the Fed, who he appointed himself. Um, his is the boldest. He remains an oppositional figure right in the heart of, 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 of government. But in most countries, I'd say the populists or those conventional politicians who perhaps it's true of this country, who've adopted some of the tactics of, 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 of populists and are kind of semi-populist uh, 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 characters, are, are, I think, trying to feel whether you can have it both ways. And I would predict that having it both ways is tough. That the trouble with government, which is full of trade-offs and painful choices, and it's very hard to govern and always do immediately popular things. And... Although we've seen the wave of populism bring populists into government in many countries, I'm sceptical about whether that can last, last for too long. But let me just finish with a few reflections on the media. As you heard, um, at one level, um, uh, the New York Times is doing extremely well. Economically, um, um, things are going well for us. We have more subscribers than we ever, ever had. Uh, um, our international audience is growing faster, international subscriptions is growing very quickly as well. But at the same time, we as an industry, and the New York Times in particular, uh, uh, um, as a leading American newspaper, is under attack. Um, and it's very broad and it's very sophisticated, actually, the attack. It's multi-part. It's uh, an attack from the right. It's increasingly actually an attack from the left who think that when we ever um, uh, cover stories which are negative to, for example, Democratic candidates, we're betraying, in quotes, our side. Our view about what we're doing is we don't have a side. And if we think that Hillary Clinton, the fact that she's using a private email server is a story, we'll do the story, whichever party she's running for. In a polarised tribal country, that's getting harder. The president who's tweeted about the New York Times, I think, nearly 300 times now, um, uh, is constant in not just attacking himself, but leading uh, and keeping an attack going. Um, my own view is uh, Mr. Trump is absolutely entitled to say what he wants about our journalism. If he doesn't like it, he's free to say it like everyone else. Of course he is. Some of the language, um, calling us the enemies of the people, um, uh, calling our journalists and indeed calling the company traitors, that we're traitors to the United States, I think it's dangerous. This is a really, really problematic moment for journalism in many parts of the world. Journalists get threatened. Uh, um, our journalists get harassed and trolled uh, um, and threatened with all sorts of terrible things all the time now. I mean, every single day we have multiple incoming threats to our journalists. But we know also sometimes they get hurt and sometimes even killed. And inflammatory talk, which might encourage somebody somewhere to actually um, uh, uh, do something um, violent, I think is totally wrong. But that's where we are now. We are, we are now. And I think what I want to say, perhaps just to, just to finish these remarks, is um, I'm quite often asked, I was asked uh, this afternoon, um, you know, how do we respond to these attacks? Um, and I want to say, firstly, with the president's tweets, 
Um, if, if, if Mr. Trump says something which is wrong, which is factually incorrect, a few days after the election, the first tweet, half past six on, the, on a Sunday morning, he um, said that we were losing all of our subscribers and, and that our business was collapsing. Wasn't true. Um, we knew what the real numbers were, so we, 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 we tweeted out the real numbers. We didn't do it in a vituperative way. We're not trying to get into a kind of brawl with the president or anyone else, but we thought we ought to lay the record straight. We do sometimes rebut his attacks. Um, but people, people often say, you know, how do you really respond? And I want to say two things. Firstly, one big change we've, we've made is nowadays we absolutely make sure that we explain to the public as often as we can what we do. This is an explicit age. If you don't make things absolutely explicit and clear, you better assume that most people don't know you're doing it. We had a focus group where it turned out one young guy didn't know that the New York Times ever sent anyone to cover wars and other conflict situations. He assumed that everyone in the Times uh, uh, sat in New York and, and wrote up other people's journalism. And he said to us in the focus group, why don't you do what Vice does? Why don't you actually send people to cover the wars? And uh, this is a kind of knife in the guts for, for my colleagues in the newsroom. But his sense was because he didn't know that a, that a, a little dateline which says Lashkagar, Helmand Province, Afghanistan is a signal that this is a report on the ground. And we never said and never showed the reporter actually in, on the ground. Well, I think that's a good lesson to learn. Once you show it, people will know it's happening. So we let um, a fly on the wall documentary into the building. Uh, uh, um, despite the fact we're in the middle of an enormous digital revolution, we were doing all sorts of things and um, uh, uh, and and going through you know union difficulties and all the rest of it. But we thought people better see what we're doing so they know we're not making it up. Uh, we have a daily podcast, um, and the daily is now the most successful news podcast in the world. Uh, about 10 million monthly listeners, 2 million a typical day, three quarters 40 years old or, or younger, nearly half, 45%, 30 years old or under, so a very different audience than most news, news um, products get. But the big thing about the daily is every day you meet Times journalists, you get them talking about and explaining what they do and how they break stories and how, how hard it is and how much work they do. So we're going to be much more explicit about just being completely transparent and letting everyone understand what we do. But the, the biggest reply is we believe in journalism. We're hiring journalists. We have 300 more journalists. We've got 1,750 journalists today. That's 300 more than when I started in 2012. And we think the best answer to attacks on journalists is more journalism is more journalists, more investigative journalists in particular. We've got more investigative journalists than we've ever had. So in a funny way, rather than kind of, you know, battles in the, in the, in the Twitter sphere, it's about doing the job that we all learned and, and just standing to classic principles. The New York Times was put on earth to seek the truth and help people understand the world. And the more we do that, we believe the more, in the end, the truth will out and, and lies will lose. So, you know, when people say, you know, how do you think about this? I think, you know, we're 170 years old. We're very patient. We're, go on, we're going to go on trying to report the truth in the belief that sooner or later, the lies and the oversimplifications and the exaggerations, you know, get found out. Um, I think you can fool people a lot of the time, and certainly there are seasons, difficult seasons of public anger, where populists and others can get a long way uh, uh, and into people's, into the public's hearts, and they can persist politically for a long time. But uh, the New York Times was founded on the idea, in the end, that holding people to account, even powerful people to account, in the end makes a difference. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much for this uh, truly thought-provoking, highly inspiring talk. Uh, also a bit historical as well.
And uh, definitely I, what I sensed uh, from it, it was, was a glimmer of hope that you, you mentioned that you don't believe this current wave of populism will last too long. Uh, and also you made your talk very relatable to the audience here because uh, uh, there are many journalists, many people and journalists in, in this room who are also used, unfortunately, to hearing from the head of the state that they are the enemy of the, sta of the, of the state yeah. and of the, of the people. So I think it's it's uh, sort of reassuring to to hear that the you you have advice uh, for them how to cope with uh, these uh, these kind of attacks and I think that uh, this is something we'll get back to during during the debate. Yeah. But before we do so, uh, we have three brilliant respondents uh, here and with us, and um, I would now, now like to introduce uh, them briefly. Although uh, they are all well known to the audience, I, I, I'm very much sure about that. Uh, Emma Smetana, who, alongside with her musical and uh, acting career, works as a journalist and interviewer at uh, the Pioneer Czech Online news uh, uh, server DV, uh, news channel DVTV, which she moved to in 2017 after having spent four years at uh, TV Nova. So welcome, Emma. <laughs> Jerzy Hoshek, chief commentator at the online news server Seznam Spravy, former London and Berlin correspondent uh, of the Czech Public Radio. Welcome. <laughs> and, uh, and last but not least, Michal Jantowski, our uh, host, uh, former diplomat ambassador to the UK, US and Israel. Prior to that politician and senator, we could go on and on. Uh, these are well-known data from his CV, but fewer people know that he actually has had a journalistic past too, as a Reuters correspondent in Prague before 1999. So, welcome to him. <laughs> each, each of our panelists will now get a five-minute uh, briefly uh, time to respond to Mark uh, Thompson's comments and uh, come up with come up with their own ideas concerning the topic of, uh, of tonight's debate. Starting with Emma, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I'm actually, I've been anxious since yesterday because um, I'm not very used to be a panelist anywhere. I'm not sure I deserve uh, sitting here with all those people. So I'm equally honored <laughs> and embarrassed uh, to be honored with you, uh, to be honest with you because of uh, my birth date and because um, my journalistic experience is obviously the shortest of all the people that you watch sitting here with me. So um, I might have a tendency to feel guilty for every word I say because that's one word less they say. Uh, and they do know a bit more, uh, I think, about what you want to hear. Uh, and I'm also more used to ask questions than uh, give statements and answers. And when I do, I regret it afterwards, usually. So um, I hope you, I'll be the you know person that speaks least here. Um, I would like to say, from uh, what I heard by Mr. Thompson, who is very optimistic today, which is the main thing I thanked him for after our today's interview, this optimism that is not very much shared among Czech journalists, I would say, from my short experience. Um, I I found it very, very fun that you call the most powerful man in the world Donald and the most powerful liar of Europe, Boris. That's something I, I just couldn't imagine uh, Czech journalists doing in public, calling our president Milos, so I'll take it as a source of inspiration, maybe. Um, I actually think it's a, it's a pity we don't have a representative of uh, the Czech public TV channel, which is probably the one that is most under political attacks and pressure that you've spoken of. Um, so maybe we might include that issue further on in the debate. So thank you so much for having me, and uh, and again, I'm sorry for the nervosity. That that is there's no sense for me hiding it. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Emma, and no no need to feel nervous or inappropriate on on the line. I'm sure that your journalistic uh, credits credits speak for themselves. Uh, here. Uh, next in line is Jerzy Hoshek, and uh, while of course he's now based at the ambitious online news brand, backed by one of the few successful competitors to Google, 
as a matter of fact. Uh, he is also uh, someone who has a, an experience as a public service journalist, so not with public service TV, but public service radio, so maybe he can draw on uh, some of these challenges of uh, polarization and digital transition uh, combining these, these two experiences. Easy. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having the chance to, to be here with you tonight. And uh, I'd like to speak briefly about this whole phenomenon and perception of uh, alienation of, of viewers, listeners and, and readers. And uh, I think before blaming anyone else, I think we should start with, uh, with ourselves. And I, I would like to speak here for, for me, media of public service and, and, and speak of my own uh, experience of, uh, of being a foreign correspondent to both uh, Berlin and, uh, and, and London. And Mark mentioned uh, uh, the language that, that, that we use. And, and I think, uh, to be fair, I think we, we, we live in a certain bubble and, and, and we yeah. should actually... Uh, make a far bigger effort of, of actually uh, going to the countryside and uh, if, you, if you compare uh, United Kingdom and the Czech Republic you, you discover that uh, London is not the United Kingdom and, and Prague is definitely not the Czech Republic and that if you take a journey 50 kilometers away from the metropole you discover a completely different country, uh, completely different uh, set of voters, readers, and, and generally people with, with different attitude and different priorities and, and also different language. And, uh, and I think uh, maybe our communication has become far too arrogant and, uh, and posh. And, and this was something that contributed to us uh, losing some of, uh, of the trust. Uh, Specifically in, in, in the Czech Republic, but I think this is a broader uh, phenomenon, some of the journalists, I think, also started to take uh, uh, too many emotions into their, their stories. Sometimes, I know it, 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 it's extremely uh, difficult to, to stay, stay neutral, and uh, I, I, I remember some of the complaints that were filed against me when I was... Uh, a Czech radio correspondent when when uh, one of uh, my uh, very fierce uh, criticism was really a bit of a stalker he was just saying well how can I trust a, a person who is so negative about Brexit who is just so deeply convinced that Brexit is wrong I just cannot listen to his news stories on Brexit for for literally uh, 10 seconds uh, I think there is a certain fair point and, and also I think quite a few journalists are not careful enough when, when, they, when they are active on, on social media and uh, it's very difficult to make a division between your public performances on, on, on social media and then your actually news, uh, news activities. And uh, I think this has caused uh, uh, a lot of harm uh, as, uh, as well. Although uh, I have to say that, for instance, uh, the BBC coverage of uh, the, the Brexit referendum in 2016 was uh, the opposite poll. I think it was just so neutral and uh, the, the level of certain... Uh, correctness was was even sometimes absurd and it also had a lot of do with the uh, the level of knowledge of, of of British journalists about EU affairs which which to me was was appallingly low uh, I have to say in, including some of the presenters of the BBC which I can say here because you you, you left four years before that uh, I, I really cannot cannot forget these big radio and TV debates prior to June 23rd vote in 2016 when there was a, a Brexiteer sitting in a studio saying some either blatant lies or saying some really things that could not have been verified and the presenter instead of saying well hang on a second what you're saying is actually not true or it cannot be verified uh, the presenter just turned to the remainder guest in the studio and, and, and asked, 
Now, what's your take on that? What's, what's your reply? What's your reaction? Which is happening constantly, even in Czech uh, TV and radio political debates. Yeah. And it, 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 it really drives me, drives me crazy. And I think this is something where, where our standards are, uh, are lacking. And, uh, of course, uh, I think we, we, as you said brilliantly, uh, I think we, we, we have to explain our work and we, we have to get into more details about what we are doing and also why we are doing it. Because uh, quite a significant number of people uh, just <coughs> does not understand that information is a very significant human value. And once actually we let this erosion of trust towards media and journalism occur, we also allow uh, erosion of trust to democracy because I think there is a very strong bond between uh, information and the quality of democracy in the individual country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yuzi. Uh, I believe that before we give the uh, uh, floor to no, no, Michael, oh, no, is that right? No, no, okay, no, okay. No, I, I, no, I saw you, you, you sort of guess. grabbing, <laughs> grabbing a <laughs> mic. So, would you like to respond immediately? So, two super, two super quick points. I was, I was very happy to wait for my turn, but I'll, I'll go now since you. First, I wanted to say to Emma, it's really interesting, you know, that the. I think in a steady state world, it may well be that the, like the people who've done the job for longest uh, know the most, and blah blah blah. We're not in that world now. We really aren't in that world. Because of all the changes we made at, at the times, half of, we've got about 4,500 people. Half are millennials. Half are between the age of 22 and 37. So it's a colossal shift. And I swear to God, I swear to God, from my point of view, firstly, they are my greatest ally because they're almost always a vote for change. That's like, let's give it a go. They're not, they're not trying to defend some past. They, they're happy to just do things. Secondly, they're, they're closest to the devices and the digital experience. They're much closer than, they're much more native in that than me. And I have to say, the way many of them approach journalism is incredibly fresh and compelling as well. So I'm, I, I'm in a position actually of, it's like we've all got a lot to learn. And if you, particularly if you're trying to figure out how to reach out to new audiences, Often it's the youngest person in the room who's got the best insights. So, right. the, B, the BBC, I, I'm being serious about it. I mean, it's a, it's a nice point to make, but it's actually, I'm making a serious point. I just wanted to, I, I didn't have to speak now, but I just wanted to respond on the, the, the BBC point is really interesting. And I wasn't working on the BBC, for the BBC at this point, but I, I do know what the dilemma is, and I just want to explain it. Firstly, to state the absolute obvious, it's like everyone knows this and nobody believes this. You prove your love of democracy and your belief in democracy when your side loses. Everyone believes in democracy when their side wins. It's when your side loses badly and you get what you think is a terrible government. That's when you're tested on your belief in democracy. That's the first thing. Democracy is far from perfect. It gets really bad results. Stand up and be counted by believing in it even when the other side win. That's the first thing. For the BBC, it's interesting, our tradition in the UK is when there are elections or when there's a referendum, the job of the public broadcasters is not to do as much interrogation as they normally do, but to kind of provide a platform which is more like a, it's like this, it's like a political hustings and one person gets to speak and another person gets to speak and the audience get to decide who's right or who's wrong. So it's like the journalism changes in election period. And by the way, this is partly the rep representation of the People's Act. This is partly kind of what the law at least suggests. And it's very strongly to the tradition. And it's in the Brexit debate it was clearly maddening because, as it were, I'm going to exaggerate for effect, certainly from a Remain point of view, Remain will put up a distinguished Nobel Prize winning economist on the problem with Brexit and... Leave would put up Coco the Clown, and Coco the Clown got as much time as the Nobel Prize winner, and a lot of people ended up believing Coco the Clown. Weirdly, to me, that's at least part of the way democracy works, and 
you know, you can say, well, I, d I don't think it should work that way. I think we should really explain to people more who they should vote for, which is what we're really saying. I don't know. I think that's not really democracy. So I gr grudgingly, I know it's very frustrating. I think you kind of have to accept that people frankly never understand the issues when they vote or very few people understand the issues when they vote in any election let's not pretend that brexit's a unique example the public are in a haze they do it on instinct on human judgment so i, I think in the end we're going to a difficult patch but please don't let some bad election results make us think that the whole thing would be much better if we ended up in some sort of technocratic oligarchy or something which where you know wise people like us decided what happened i think History suggests that that's even worse. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mark. Uh, definitely, these were some provocative thoughts and opinions, and I'm wondering whether some people in the audience uh, might disagree with you. Uh, I, I do. Uh, but uh, we first uh, give the floor to our third panelist, Michal Jantowski. Michal, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I have to correct Emma, whom I hold in great admiration on, on two counts. Uh, first of all, uh, there's no question that of the four of us, I had the shortest journalistic career. <laughs> I had a promising career as a Reuters reporter in Prague, but then I got involved in some kind of revolution and I <laughs> ruined it for me. So uh, that was uh, also the end of it. Uh, the second thing, it's not quite true that there is no representative of the Czech public television here. We have the CEO of uh, the Czech television, Petr Dvořák, with us, and I hope that he will join uh, the discussion at a, at a later point. Now, I, I want to make two, two comments. One is on what Mark has already spoken about the, the disconnect in, in the democratic discussion and in uh, the world of media and the world of politics. I mean, it takes place at uh, many levels. Uh, the disconnect between the various bubbles on on, on, on social networks, disconnect between town and country, between you know the older and the young people. But what I'm most concerned about is the disconnect between the media and the politics. Because we, you know, keep repeating, and the politicians keep repeating that democracy is a discussion. And but I'm afraid we're having less and less of the of the discussion. I mean. The media used to be the mediator, the conductor of the discussion between the politicians and the public, and the, the instruments of that discussion were press conferences, media opportunities, face-to-face <coughs> -face interviews, and uh, the governments uh, are becoming ever more skillful at skirting around these uh, modes of interaction and and choosing unilateral uh, uh, means of conveying the information. So in the end, you know, the government tweets and uh, and the journalists are left to writing op-ed pieces yeah. because, you know, what, what else can they do? And uh, it's not as bad as that with most politicians yet, but some of the prime examples, Trump, uh, uh, the president of this country, and, uh, and quite a few others are, I'm afraid, pointing the way, and the way is, uh, is not good. And I don't know how to counter that. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, it could be done by not covering the politicians until and unless they consent to interviews, but that I'm afraid is too idealistic uh, 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 recipe for because the media also have they they boards and they uh, uh, advertising and they uh, owners so I don't know whether this would work. The other uh, thing I want to comment upon is the is the problem of uh, uh, disinformation 
and the post-truth phenomenon and uh, and how it relates to, to, to freedom of speech. Uh, the traditional media are at a complete disadvantage here because it's uh, uh, they have some standards, they have uh, ways to verifying their uh, information, they have their sourcing, they prefer most of them not to work with anonymous sources, etc, uh, etc. Et I mean, on social networks we have none of that. And, and not, even, not even that, you, you don't know where the information is, is coming from, whether it's a, a person with a name, or whether it's a, a, a pseudonym, or whether it's a, a troll, or, or, or whether it's a bot, it's not even a real person. I mean, it's, uh, it's a machine that's uh, uh, spewing out uh, uh, the, the, the misinformation. And I think this is absurd. You know, if you want to open an account in a bank, you know, you have to, these days you have to prove your identity by more than one way, you know, to to, to prove that, you know, you're not bringing in tainted money or laundered money or, uh, or some kind of suspect money. But when you enter the, the world of information and of, uh, of the uh, social networks media, there's none of that requirement. And, and the defense is that, you know, this is about privacy and we entitled to protect our privacy, etc, etc. And I think it's a completely, uh, completely uh, wrong argument because, you know, privacy is for us when we stay at home, when we protect our houses, our families, etc, etc. But, but the moment we go on a social networks, we enter the public domain. It's, it's not a private domain, it's a public discourse that we are now conducting and there should be requirements in my book that we also uh, show our identity, our uh, authority and our accountability. Thank you, Mikhail. Thank you. And, uh, also for opening up this new uh, or an additional uh, subtopic of tonight's debate, which is the disinformation, fake, fake media, fake news, and uh, the role of uh, journalism uh, in their exposure. But uh, l let me first go back to what, what Mark said uh, about uh, uh, basically the, the, the role of BBC in the election and referendum uh, is, as, as you mentioned, is, is just to provide a platform essentially. And uh, if it leads to the situation when there is uh, Coco du Clan against the Nobel Prize winner, so be it. Let the public decide what's uh, relevant or, or, or truth or not. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the crux of the problem of, of the contemporary times? At least many authors, observers are, are pointing to the fact that maybe journalists are not doing their job enough if they are sure. not confronting politicians with outward lies they are spreading and just they are letting them talk. I want to be clear that that's not the New York Times' position. Sure. Yeah. The New York Times has got a different but, mission, it, sure. I, I'm not and, and it, it's not the BBC's position, except literally in the few weeks running up to an to a to a to a uh, an election. The rest of the time, the BBC also has got a responsibility to um, uh, to interrogate and to hold to account politicians and, and indeed all other public figures. But the 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 BBC, which is still reaching something like 85% of the population every week, and they're spending still 14, 15 hours a week with the BBC every week, that's 80% of households, um, the extraordinary prominence means, and the fact that British people do look at and listen to uh, TV and radio um, during elections, means that the public do have, a, do have a chance to decide for themselves. Now, there is fact-checking. The BBC in its news programmes does, does, does fact-checking, but in its, its debate programmes typically are a bit like um, uh, political hustings, where you go and a crowd go and each politician gets to speak. Um, you can debate whether this is good or bad. It, it's, it's different from journalism. This is a slightly different role than journalism. In my view, journalism should always be hard-hitting. And just to, to, to agree with, um, and maybe elaborate one, one point, um, 
I sort of feel that the 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 relationship between media and, and politicians has always been kind of cat and mouse. You can argue who's the cat and who's the mouse, but it's been, you know, they, they want nice headlines. We want to ask hard questions. You know, there's a kind of natural tension there. This is healthy in many ways. And it's complete, it's human nature. The politicians should want to reach around the awkward, nasty media and appeal directly to the public and use Twitter and Facebook and half a dozen other different ways of kind of appealing directly to the public. Um, we need to think hard of making sure that whatever they do and wherever they go, they're still held to account. Um, you know, one of the best things, it's very expensive and difficult to do, is investigative journalism. You know, if you won't reveal your tax returns, we'll find them anyway. Um, um, that's the kind of that's the kind of ace of spades. That's the key trump card to play. But it's hard for many journalistic organisations to do it. But I, I think you can't really say that politicians should be prevented from using Twitter because it's unfair. Um, I hope that we could reach a position where um, journalists and politicians each recognise that it was worth still trying to figure out a way of, of, of kind of working together. And I do think journalists, I, I always think journalists should be very tough with politicians. I also think it's not unreasonable with a given politician to let, you know, let her or him say a few words before you start with the tough questioning to, to let them begin to set out their ideas before you start slamming the questions in. I think it was the media's habit of not even allowing them to draw breath before we hit them. That was one of the reasons I think that the relationship soured. And I think giving them a little bit of space and then hitting them across examination wouldn't, wouldn't be a bad compromise. But to be clear, I do believe in holding politicians to account. Just a, a little comment. I never realized until now that the expression trump card can be <laughs> double entendre. <laughs> no, I, I, would, I still like, like to go back to these uh, TV and, and, and radio debates on BBC yeah. in June 2016. I mean, you're absolutely right about fact-checking, but when the debate right. just... Uh, uh, went on from 8 p.m. to till till 10 p.m. and yeah. the fact checking started appearing on BBC's website at 10:30. Yeah. It yeah. must have breached like one percent of uh, of viewers of listeners. So yeah. so actually the impact was was close to zero. Uh, well, I, I, and I, as, I, as you know, I'm, I'm trying to say it, that that's almost like a set piece, which which the BBC is more or less required to do and has always done in the past. Fact checking is very interesting though, and I think that you could feel the New York Times figuring out. Because um, this is new. This is, a, this is a discontinuity in p politics in many countries. And uh, political journalists, it's quite hard to predict a, a, a con discontinuity. You're used to patterns which continue. When, when it breaks and something different happens, it's hard to spot. Then you have to try and figure out how to cover it. But over the spring summer of 2016, so this is the, the election campaign in the US that led to the um, election of Trump. You can see, you can feel the times, you can look at it on, on the archive, thinking about fact-checking in a new way. And it starts off, fact-checking used to be like paragraph 15, a bit like your 1030. It used to be way down the story. You'd say, we've, we've looked at what Senator Clinton or you know, Senator Kennedy said and, and looked at the facts sort of thing. With Donald Trump, this fast, this kind of quick-fire Twitter storm from Trump, um, where Trump the whole time is just throwing new stuff out there, we ended up thinking you've got to do the fact, you've got to begin with the fact check context in the headline. And, and by the summer, we're doing headlines like Donald Trump falsely claimed that or Donald Trump claimed without evidence that. Um, so that the person, before they even read what he said, have got a context, which is actually this isn't true. Um, and so, uh, I mean, m in my view, um, when you're doing straight journalism, the sooner you give people some kind of context, how should I think about this, the better. Because the danger, if you don't, is most people never get past the first two paragraphs, essentially. And, and uh, I think this is exactly your point. And then maybe may left with a false impression. So we changed, and we used, for, I think, for the first time ever, the word lie that summer as well. 
used very sparingly. It's been used once or twice since, two or three times since. But also, Ben essentially said that something that Donald said was a lie. In other words, he knew he knew it was wrong. He knew it was false when he said it. No, I just uh, meant to react because you were speaking about journalists in plural because you live now in a country and in a newspaper that's got a 170 years of a tradition. You are now visiting a country where I would say journalists are a very heterogeneous species. I'm not sure there's a, I would say, I don't know, collective identity of, of journalism as such because we're still on the way to yeah. professional journalism from my point of view. And when uh, Michael said democracy is a discussion, I just realized a thing, which is that uh, politicians in this country are actually divided into groups that are ready and available for, for example, DVTV, which is the media I work for, and other, there are just parties that systematically avoid us and that have chosen media they accept to appear on because they know what questions to accept and the questions seem acceptable to them. And there are media that are very ready to collaborate in a sense in order to get the politicians speak on air. And actually we are in a situation where there's a part of politicians that don't need other media than those those chosen ones. And one experience that was very strong for me was uh, after last uh, parliamentary elections. There was a far-right party that got into into parliament and there was a list of journalists and media that just were not allowed to be at the press conference to be around the party to ask any questions of course tv tv was one of them and i was just wondering because i'm half french and I, have, I had written for a french newspaper if this had happened in france i couldn't imagine other journalists that were allowed to be there to stay there yeah. and i would accept expect some kind of you know collective yeah. reaction saying okay so we're all leaving, which is something that didn't happen. I'm not even sure many journalists thought about it as an option. Those who were in probably felt grateful for being in. So I don't know. Was I right thinking they should have left? Do you want a quick, quick comment? Yeah. Or? I, I can. Maybe we should we bring in uh, Yiri's point and then. Uh, well, I, I wanted to make a, a point on on this uh, excess of, of journalists to, to politicians and, and, and vice versa. And, and my strong recommendation would be to to focus on topics, focus on uh, on the agenda. I mean, if, if we talk about radio and TV, uh, let's let's go for a longer interview with a politician about you know the strategies and policies, etc. But when you have a, a very serious uh, you know, law proposal in in Parliament. Just you know, don't make this row of of empty, silly reactions of the individual chairman of of parties and and MPs who you know praise the government proposal or they they criticize it without actually having a, any any substance. And if I may, you know, give some praise to Czech television, I think. Uh, when they start their evening news, more and more they focus on on personal stories of people affected by the individual laws. And, and, and this is a language which can be understood and, and the impact on, on the, the, the readers, listeners and viewers is, is much bigger and much better rather than giving floor and space to, you know, six individual people politicians who three of them are going to support the idea and and three of them are going to criticize it but this approach is is very time consuming and is 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 a very lengthy journalistic method so i really would love to live in an ideal perfect world of editors in chief giving millions of time to to their to their you know reporters to file their stories until they are really waterproof, completely ready. But we always have our deadlines and we always have to make compromises, of course. Michael, first? Uh, or did you want to come in? Uh, okay, let's, Let, let's have uh, Mark respond. Mark. Uh, okay, so, I, so the, I mean, the, I mean the, these are all really, really interesting points. I mean, firstly, to, 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 to Emma's point, I, I want to say, yeah, I mean, we, we have, I mean, at, at the times we have very close relations with many other leading American newspapers and there is a sense of solidarity and there are examples of us 
in different ways supporting each other um, um, when one of us is under under um, attack. And in, in matters of the First Amendment, I'd say it's almost like NATO. Um, an attack on one is an attack on all. And that's, that's our view, that if there's a serious um, an attempt, for example, to pursue a journalist um, uh, because of a leak inquiry, we would all want to act in concert um, to, to defend that journalist and defend that newspaper. Um, but this is not perfect. And in, in the United States now, there are, there are media, uh, there's conservative media, uh, particularly internet media, who would not re believe that was uh, at all necessary. And I can absolutely be imagine, with the current administration, a group of conservative news outlets continuing to go to press conferences, even if, as it were, much of the mainstream media had decided to boycott them. So we won't get solidarity across the industry um, because the industry is also, to some extent, polarised by the broader polarisation. And, uh, I mean, I don't know how many people here get to the States, but the, the polarisation of discourse, political discourse, in America is, has got to be seen to be really believed. Um, the cable news channels, you, you hardly ever see the same people on different channels. They literally just don't appear. There's a, there's a liberal world and there's a conservative world. And the politicians and the pundits are all happy in their own world. They have all these discussion programs, which are not debates because everyone agrees with each other. So they're not really debates even. Um, one of the great glories of the, of, 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 uh, the way um, uh, the BBC and the other British broadcasters do politics is we do still get proper programmes with a group of politicians from different parties um, and an, a live audience, both on radio and television, any questions and question time, and somebody asks a question from the audience and the politicians actually have to discuss with each other and they actually have to be reasonably polite because it looks stupid and bad if they're not. So you do, I think there's a better culture actually of politicians being forced to discuss um, uh, real policy and debate real policy because they should debate with each other and people should hear them debating rather than just name calling um, uh, in the UK than many other countries. Um, but I mean, I, I want to say... I think it's 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 all under strain at the moment. Um, I do think that the 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 business of actually, I, I I worry slightly about excluding politicians. I agree that pointless, angry sound bites don't help anyone. But but sometimes the BBC has gone so far down the road of human stories. You know, the sharp end, the the poor, unemployment, education, health, whatever it is and then had experts talking, that the politicians who are, after all, in many ways, the nation's leaders, have been excluded. That doesn't feel right as well. So we haven't found your perfect world yet, I suppose, is the headline. But I, I definitely think it can't just be noise. It can't just be political noise. It's somehow got to be the politicians being almost compelled to talk thoughtfully about what's going on. And I always think that showing the public... That the, the broadcaster understands that this is all about, also about real lives, real jobs, real everything. That's very important as well. Now, uh, in fact, this is uh, a, a method, an instrument that uh, is uh, today employed by on both sides of the divide, the the politicians and and the media as well. I mean. It, I don't know whether the politicians learned it from the media or the media learned it from the politicians, but uh, they both learned that the best way to present a, a position is to tell a story and that it attracts more voters or sells more newspapers uh, or, or, or both. So, uh, but uh, it, uh, the, the, the danger of that that it may down the road lead to what I call polytainment. Uh, that the entertainment factor is so much mixed with the political argument that you know people uh, watch it as a as a as a game of thrones, but uh, don't really realize what's involved uh, uh, behind it. Uh, 
I would like, if I may, to go back to Mark's last point, because uh, in, in your comment you sort of uh, steered the debate back to the question of polarization, which I'm grateful for. Uh, there was an article written, published very recently, I think last week, by Peter Pomerantsev in the American Interest. And the article was called The Death of the Neutral Public Sphere. And in that article, Peter Pomerantsev has argued that uh, there is a sort of failure of, of especially commercial media, but, but public service as well, that uh, in, in the way that they, they have failed the task to smooth polarization, which he sees as, as the thing, as, as the task to overcome, uh, to, to build bridges and, and a dialogue, because they have opted to play into polarization. And it, strangely, for some media, it, some, it seems like it has become a successful business strategy to actually yeah. exploit the, 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 these, the, these divides. It's not just ideological, but it's commercially successful. And then there are, of course, the algorithms that are sort of working towards polarization anyway, because they are bringing us the, and exposing us to the stories and, and uh, articles that we like to tend, to tend to agree with rather than disagree. So from that, that perspective, I mean, how do you see the, the role of, of leading legacy organizations such as the New York Times, which are of course labeled and, and associated with one particular ideological point of view, uh, what, what is their, what they can, what can they do to really overcome this? I think whatever you do, um, it's going to take time to have its effect. Um, I think you've put, you put your finger on a number of interesting, very, very important points. Um, just a couple of them. The, 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 I think it varies. I, I don't believe we're still seeing a kind of Trump effect today at the Times. I think that's long gone. But it's true, I think, that uh, um, book publishers are discovering that more and more the books that sell about politics are the most opinionated and the most partisan. That, as it were, neutral studies of politics don't really... People want to re buy books with titles like "It's Even Worse Than You Think" or you know, "The Truth About Trump" or uh, you know. And by the way, books in favour of Trump do very well as well. So I think that sense of the, I think that feels absolutely right. The other thing is, I, I do think that in the broader sense, digital is. I think digital is kind of neutral. Um, um, Thomas Hobbes has got a line about language, and he really means rhetoric. And and um, uh, he, he lines basically is language, i.e. the acquisition of language and kind of social language, didn't make mankind better. It merely increased our possibilities. So he's saying it kind of let us do more for good or ill. And I think the idea of digital media as an accelerant, everything happens faster, and as a magnifier, it kind of, things get built up, they catch fire, and it naturally, um, social media in particular, it suits more radical, more strong language, shorter language, that language I talked about, the kind of punchy language, and it sort of somehow this gathers momentum very quickly. Stories get told and they're kind of called. I mean, the idea of what does this story mean? Who's guilty? What does it, what does it mean? Um, that used to take days. A story would roll on for days before the, the world passed judgment. People are trying to do that in the first four or five minutes um, of a story breaking. They're trying to call it. And that whistles around the world. And you get these astonishing effects. Um, I remember um, um, uh, with the famous Danish cartoon, um, uh, we showed um, on our lunchtime bulletin of the BBC a glimpse, not of the prophet, but of a bit of a turban um, to give a sense of this. This had been an image of the prophet. We showed a kind of, yeah. I mean, it was it was not it was not heroic. It was this much. But within two hours, there was a crowd gathering outside our bureau in Cairo, angry crowd, because the internet was telling them the BBC had shamelessly shown the whole cartoon and was forcing Muslim users of the BBC to, to watch it. It's a completely false rumour, but ours, literally people turning up in the street and in other, uh, other Middle Eastern, uh, outside other Middle Eastern bureaus. So there's something about that which I think makes this very, very hard. It makes rebuttal hard. It makes 
just being calm and objective very hard as well. Mm -hmm. Yuji, wanted to comment quickly? Oh, I just wanted to say my, my, my little personal story linked to the, the story of, uh, of the, the Danish cartoons and this was the moment when, where I completely fell in love with Denmark as a country because I was, uh, I was uh, posted in Berlin and I arrived in, in Copenhagen shortly the, after cartoons were published and uh, it was just absolute shocker for me because it was already we lived in the time of uh, you know uh, military being deployed in the streets with machine guns etc and I arrived at the, the reception of Danish Parliament as a radio reporter with a bag full of cables and really some suspicious devices and I was not controlled at all and actually I was just led straight into the building into the main uh, main hall of Danish Parliament and and the first person you know I came across gave me a mobile number of the of the editor of the cultural editor of Julans Posten Fleming Rose, yeah. who actually published the cartoons and I, I rang this this person was the most interviewed person in the world in that particular week and I thought you know he's just gonna say well just piss off you just not in, not interesting to me and and he just invited me straight into his office not tomorrow but the very minute i i called him for the first time so that was just mightily mightily impressive uh, uh, may, maybe we sometimes running a, a small risk of uh, trying to envisage an ideal picture of a relationship between uh, politics and the media there there is no such picture I mean it's uh, uh, different roles of two different spheres of uh, of human activity uh, politics will always try to present the world as orderly unproblematic and all the problems resolved etc etc and the media will always look for conflict for controversy for something irregular i mean one of the founder of uh, journalism in this country ferdinand perotka you know once put it that you know news is not about a roof layer working on the roof news is about the roof layer falling off the roof and uh, and that you know will always be in the in the nature of the business and that's also what makes the business fascinating and uh, and and worth reading and following okay uh we have about 30 minutes uh, remaining for this debate so high time to bringing the audience to open the debate uh, to the to the discussions and, and questions from the audience. I would like to ask everyone, we'll take uh, uh, several questions at once in a few rounds, and I would like everyone to uh, tell us, say who they are, and keep their question very brief and up to the point. So please, who would like to start? There was a, there was a hand, there was a hand, and there is a hand. Okay, let's start. Yeah, please. okay, so uh, good evening. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so I guess, I'm just going to say that I'm a journalist, I work in public service media, and I'm 24 years old, so I guess I'm also a millennial. <laughs> but my question and my biggest fear working as a journalist is uh, that I will not be able to affect anyone or bring anything to anyone, anything new, that is already not part of my followers or my media followers. If you know what I mean, I feel like in today's world, the rift between I don't want to say left right because I don't think it's left right, but between the two, you know, between the groups of people who disagree with each other are bigger and bigger. And I don't think that medias are building enough bridges, if you know what I mean, that they are not trying to bring the people closer. And I feel like that's one of the biggest problems that at least I feel we face. How do I explain my point in a civilized manner and I try to uh, make someone else agree with my point or explain to him that there is something else? Mm -hmm. there was a, can you take uh, a few yeah. more? Yeah. yeah, please. Okay. I'm not a journalist, I'm a reader. Um, <laughs> in the 1975 <coughs> referendum on the EU in England, there was only one newspaper who campaigned against the EU. And that was the Morning Star, which is a communist run paper. In the 1916, the Quality Press were actually against Leave. 
the quality press who were owned by foreign owners. So it's about the, my question was about the ownership of them. Yeah. So Murdoch and the Barclays and everything, they had huge uh, personal motivation for convincing the British public to vote leave. Okay, and the final question is round. There was a uh, hand in the middle, at the back somewhere. Or, okay, well, okay. Uh, hi, my name is Simona Yankova, I'm a journalist as well, and I have actually two questions. <laughs> the first one, uh, where do you see the role of local media in this topic? And second one, uh, do you think it is reasonable for national media to have local mutations um, of, uh, for example, online newspapers, especially in the regions where the economic situation is not so good and it seems like uh, people lost their interest in democracy. Thank you. Thank you. So we have three questions. One, uh, if I understood correctly, more about the role of an individual journalist, uh, how, how media, yeah, well, or media yeah. in general, how to overcome the, the, the divides in the, in the digital environment, then the role of ownership and the local, the future of local media. So three great questions. I, I, first, I want to say the way you're asking the question of yourself is exactly the right way it seems to me to, 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 to be doing that. In other words, we have to be very reflective and recognize that it's a puzzle. Um, one or two positive things to say. Some of the most important journalism that's happening today is reaching right across the, 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 the divide. Um, um, I think that some aspects of the economy, some aspects of climate change, I think actually gender um, around the world, um, you know, I accept there is there, there are a minority of conservatives who want to go off the topic entirely. But, but for example, our, our reporting on um, Bill O'Reilly and Harvey Weinstein and others started, I think, a global debate. I think you can still. I mean, that was one group of people, uh, in particular, um, um, a couple of um, brilliant uh, women journalists, Jodie Cantor, Megan Tui. Who um, who triggered? We got a fantastic Instagram of them pressing the send button on the Weinstein story. That triggered a global debate and a, a, a debate in the workplace, at home, between men and women. And that debate wasn't just liberals doing it. So we can sometimes trigger things which pass, but I think it's harder. It's like getting younger people to get engaged in serious news. You have to get into the head of the audience and try and see the world from their point of view. I think ownership, of course, I mean, you know, in the end, the Marxists are right about this, go to, go to the economic sort of thing and look at where the real power lies. Um, I think it's going to be incredibly important. And I think there's a practical um, risk that if, as it were, conventional business model fails in the US, the risk that very, very rich individuals will end up being really significant in, in media ownership. Uh, is going to grow, and I know that frankly the issue of media ownership is pretty is pretty current in this country too. Um, so I'm, I'm well aware of this. Uh, and and why do people buy media? Well, for what it's worth, I've met one or two people, and I have to say, Jeff Bezos, the um, founder of Amazon's one. I think I, I honestly believe. Call me naive. I think he's not bought it because he wants to get influence for Amazon or. Um, I think he genuinely believes in, in good journalism and wants to support it. So we may get some very good billionaires. As a plan for the future of media, billionaire ownership, as it were, and, and concentrations of media power in the, hand, in, in the hands of a small number of commercial interests is not good for democracy. I mean, I think you're right, you're right to worry about that. And... Um, now, what was the last one? It was... Um, local, 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 local media. media. Well, I mean, um, the th and I'll come to the second part of your question first. Um, you know, should there be local mutations, I think you said. I mean, local, uh, maybe part of a national report could be local. I mean, but if, if you like, if the problem with local is the economic challenge of the cost of putting so many people on the ground, and once you go local, of course, you're doing it in lots of different places may not be covered by the revenue, that actually afflicts you, even if you're a national title. So if there's a problem with the activity of local journalism, even national news organisations will find it hard. I think local, in most parts of the Western world, is really difficult. Um, 
you can't scale. The New York Times, we know, we, we think we're going to get 10 million subscribers by 2025. That scale, um, it's very hard to scale locally. Um, and by the way, it doesn't really much help if you're scaling locally in the English language. It's hard everywhere. Um, and I mean, what I hypothesize, some kind of mixture of commercial revenue, um, um, potentially philanthropy, potentially higher education, um, 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 potentially communities and, and, and community involvement may be part of a solution. But I would say I haven't been anywhere where I think they've solved this problem. I think it's really worrying. Anyone want to comment? No? Or shall we go for a second round? Uh, I see a hand at the back here and the third one. Okay, so let's do that round over there. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Dylan. I'm a student from New York. Um, you guys touched on the growing polarization of the conservative and liberal media. And kind of what I was wondering is, um, at least in America, we're taught that democracy and capitalism are two, two things that always work. And with the social media, like news outlets, it kind of feels like a m more pure capitalist I concept where you can choose which news you want to hear. You choose everything that you, you see on your Instagram, your Facebook platform. Do you think that capitalism is, that platform capitalism is hurting democracy in the sense that <coughs> more and more people are less informed because they're only hearing the news they want to? Thank you. Uh, that was a question next uh, somewhere. Uh, if we, if you could pass the mic. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, I'm Cedric. I'm from Germany, studying dentistry there. So I don't even know quite why I'm here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm sort of connecting to his question, putting a statement up to you, or just wondering: Is it not important in our society? Um, in our democratic society with regarding algorithms for government to get proactive and perhaps regulate to for platforms to bridge this um, great divide yeah. so that people start arguing with each other and not amongst their own peer group once again. Okay. There was a, one question in the back, yeah, Mati? <laughs> Thank you. I would like to comment on some of the Mark Thompson's remarks. You said things like, you know, we are 170 years old, we are going to play a long game. And, you know, democracy is about, you know, whether the bad guys win or lose, we'll wait it out, etc., etc. I think this has one, one very important presupposition, and that's the stability of institutions. And I would call this like an Anglo-American illusion that, that you think that institutions yeah. are, are stable and don't change. We in Central Europe uh, know that institutions change and revolutions happen and freedom tends not to last very long. So, so, so if, if this is the game and if the nature of the system is, is at stake, what is the role of journalism then? If it's not just about you know, informing in a stable environment, if it's about informing in a dangerous environment that's changing all the time profoundly. Thank you. Okay. So we have two big questions, questions on the sort of relationship between capitalism and democracy, on the role of government in uh, regulating algorithms that are g g getting out of hand, and finally the stability of institutions from the perspective of especially certain central, central Eastern Europe. Yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll come on to the dose of healthy Central European pessimism in a moment. <laughs> 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 I, I expect nothing less. Uh, um, uh, uh, the 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 um, so the algorithms and the the the, the question of whether um, choice um, is kind of strengthening or weakening um, democracy is kind of incredibly interesting and 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 um, I probably won't do it justice. I mean, I I absolutely believe I want to um, that uh, I want to agree with Cedric really that that um, some some sense of oversight of um, of how, as it were, behind the curtain choices are made and some sense of ultimate public scrutiny of, in a sense, are these transparent processes? Are they, are, are the, are the straightforward commercial um, um, calculations in the mix? Um, 
are, for example, you know, more radical, more engaging comments and reviews favoured over more boring but more thoughtful and more reasonable ones? These are really good questions. Something's going to happen. But the truth is, I mean, the truth is kind of, it's really scary. No one knows. The, the algorithms change continuously. I mean, they change every minute. The algorithm, the, 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 this code is never static. It's never static. Uh, and if you, you it, it's it's quite hard to see, given it's kind of li living organism, and no human being, no one human being, knows the algorithm. I mean, there is no, there's no kind of map of it. There's no written record of it. it it's an organic thing. And um, <clears throat> with machine learning, essentially, parts of the algorithm are fixing and improving themselves in real time. So the machine is making the machine better and changing the machine. It's a very tall order. Um, I mean, there's an element of having created a, 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 a something we don't understand already um, about what's going on here. I mean, my view is that much of what social media and search is doing, actually, the idea of taking signals from people's behavior on a vast scale and using that to improve the service in different ways is probably okay. Um, the point I make when I talk to people like Mark Zuckerberg and the leadership at, at Google is with news, you've got to be careful. Um, with Facebook, we were talking about this earlier today, we had a big row with Facebook because they, they got so worried about their reputational hits they were taking, they wanted to label half of what they have on their on their uh, on their uh, from from the news news industry as political advertising and they basically rang us up and said do you care if we label your content when you use it for marketing you label it we, we label it as political advertising we said we do care we do care about that really and they eventually backed down um so i i want to say i think there can be symbiosis that with both search and social there's no reason why people shouldn't if they want to um uh, get things recommended by their friends. Um, honestly, you know, the, the, the idea of an echo chamber didn't begin, absolutely didn't begin uh, with digital. The, uh, people, we've always known, play a disproportionate amount of weight when they're thinking about how to vote on what their family and their friends are doing. That kind of herd effect in, in voting is very well established over many. That's what human beings do. And actually... The serendipity of digital devices, the fact you might bump into other opinions, may actually slightly reduce that danger as well. Um, but the interesting thing is, we don't know the answer to these questions. That The political scientists haven't caught up, and we don't actually know, I don't think, how this stuff changes voter intention. You know, politicians think it might, which is why they're spending so much money on dodgy companies like Cambridge Analytica. But we don't yet really know... It kind of doesn't feel right. It feels dangerous. We don't really know how much. Now, institutions. Um, I think it's... I mean, look, first of all, I, I, I absolutely want to say, and it is, it is a useful corrective to be, re, 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 to, re, to be reminded that the fact that, you know, the UK has had some centuries of basically stable democratic institutions does not mean that's the norm around the world. And by the way, it doesn't even mean that we can be sure we're going to have centuries more of it. Um, um, I think my point really is um, this feels like a very tactical moment in politics. And, you know, we believe in strategy. In other words, we believe in a long-term commitment. And the thing we believe in is much more to do with a collective kind of community sense of conviction about... Uh, um, so in my particular institution, I'm not really talking about the business model. I'm talking more about the fact... You know, like a great university, a tradition of learning, we've got a tradition going back generations of believing in the civic and social value of journalism and of doing everything you can to get it to work. And honestly, I haven't got any better ideas. Um, you know, where are you going to stand and fight? And, and for me, standing and fighting on the principle of the, the importance and the value of quality journalism and the hope Let's not be certain. Let's the hope that sooner or later that journalism is going to make a difference is the best idea I've got. And if, if you say to me, are you sure it's going to work? Because there are many countries, this is one where we've seen that being snuffed out. I'm not sure, 
but I don't really see what the alternative is other than kind of giving up, really. So that that's where I stand on that. Michael wants to comment. Yeah, yeah. I think this is very important, and it it concerns another phase of journalism we have not uh, spoken about yet. And it's certainly true that we may be in again for dangerous times here or elsewhere in Europe or elsewhere in the world. But uh, my point would be that journalism becomes more important in those times rather than less important. In three weeks time, we're going to hold a small symposium here called uh, Getting the Message Across on the work of the foreign correspondents here and the foreign radios in 1989. And that also includes some of the underground uh, journalists who worked here uh, before 1989. And, and we're going to try to illustrate the difference that uh, they made. And, and the journalists are still making under the most extreme most dangerous circumstances around the world. Look at the work some of the Russian journalists are, are, are doing under very difficult circumstances, uh, not to mention war zone journalism, etc., uh, etc. Et so I think it's just one more reason, the, time, the, the, the fact that the times are uncertain, to, to put our trust in, in, in journalism because that's how we learn what's going on. Um, I just remembered uh, during your opening speech you showed your book saying it was non-fiction so it reminded me of uh, my four, nearly four experiences at TV Nova which is the uh, number one public uh, private private channel in the Czech Republic which does something that is not polytainment as Michael said but infotainment it actually is aired after a soap opera and before another soap opera, so it has to keep up <laughs> the dramatic level that is expected from it. And even though Michael said we shouldn't idealize the relationship between politicians and journalists and the world in general, I feel as a young woman it's my job to still idealize a bit. So uh, I used to get into incredible fights with my with my colleagues and with the heads of the news on TV Nova, precisely because I had the impression that even though it is a it is a private channel doing infotainment in a actually quite mm, I would say admitted way, not a hidden one, I still thought we should stick to the facts and to the complexity of truth, etc. And I just saw nearly four years that it was actually only losing all the time to something I might call guilty pleasures, because the other sun side might be more fun, the other discourse is more rude, so more likely to be followed, because less boring. And when my colleague from the radio, if I'm not mistaken, asked about how to report uh, issues and ev events in a civilized manner, I actually just had an, another question woken up inside of me, which is how do you solve the problem of um, the appeal of conspiracies and fake news, or at least the, um, let's say, simplified or superficial reporting of facts. Um, how do you fight, I don't know, intellectual laziness, maybe, that I think is part of the problem in this country, for sure, and probably kind of everywhere. <laughs> okay. Maybe last round of question. We have uh, questions. We have time for oh, there's so many hands. Okay, one, two, three, four. We'll see if we get there. Let's let's start with these four. Please. Good afternoon, Kamelo. Uh, speaking, Mr. Thompson. I have a question about two political whistleblowers, uh, Edward Snowden and Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. What do you think about their political activities? Are these guys heroes for you or traitors? Thank you. Okay, next question. Um, I just want to ask Mr. Thom Thompson as well about, um, you mentioned at the beginning you had a breakfast with uh, President Trump and I'm just really curious like when you meet 
you know, what, what kind of a discussion are you having when um, you mentioned in the next sentence, you know, uh, 300 tweets against you, um, some of them you consider dangerous to journalism, so um, what do you talk about? Okay, next, next to you, or behind? Yeah. I don't think I can uh, beat that question um, <laughs> at all. But uh, actually, mine, mine was also on the topic of like entertainment news. So, for example, if you take shows, and maybe the um, American and British uh, people here will be more familiar with it, but uh, such as like uh, Colbert Report in the past, Daily Show, and uh, Last Week Tonight, uh, shows like this, which provide entertainment, but also some news and some fact-checking, are those a, a beneficial influence or is it something like maybe you could call it like the left version of what Fox has on? I don't know. So I would like to hear your opinion on that. Thanks. And there was one more. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Barry. I'm from New York. Um, studying here in Prague. I was wondering, obviously Trump has attacked New York Times over 300 times and many other networks, probably more. Um, but also Bernie Sanders has used similar rhetoric yeah. um, and saying the media doesn't favor him. How much truth do you think there is in their assumption that the media favors a more mainstream moderate candidate? These were very short questions, so we have time for one more. Next to, next to you, there was a... Uh, hi, my name is Joseph. I work here at the Global Arena Research Institute here in Prague. And uh, my question, I think, it might be a little less exciting than the previous ones. And that is when you're looking at large media outlets such as these around the world uh, that you can name off, that many have been named off tonight, what is the role which they play in making sure each other are responsible, as in holding each other accountable for their actions, whether for the very extreme positive notion or the negative notion? All right, I think uh, it's a lot of our, on, on our plate. Uh, Snowden Assange, uh, very direct uh, question. Uh, maybe start it. So, so, I mean, in the end, Dean McKay, the editor of the paper, should really answer this question. But it, but it seems to me that the, the important uh, judgment for, for the Times and other you know, responsible newspapers is if you receive material which you think is in the public interest, uh, you should publish it. Um, but we don't condone or um, uh, conspire with people to um, commit crimes or steal things. Or um, um, I, I think there's a nuance between. I mean, I'm speaking really just privately uh, as an individual. I think there's a nuance between um, Edward Snowden's um, whistleblowing um, after he carefully tried to try and bring his concerns to the attention of his superiors and felt he'd failed. And I think, it, you know, although it's an extreme measure, I think whistleblowing is absolutely legitimate and indeed important. Um, and WikiLeaks, which I think is a more complicated story, um, uh, what is, for what it's worth, really, really troubling, though, is the, the second superseding indictment of Julian Assange. She's facing extradition to the US in the UK at the moment, he's in, in, in custody in the UK, I think is really troubling because it, it accuses um, Julian Assange of essentially committing journalism. Uh, the way the, it works, this is using the US Espionage Act, uh, makes it sound as if what he was doing, you know, it, it, it accuses him of doing something which is exactly what journalists do. So there are very serious First Amendment objections to the current, um, the current indictment of Mr. Assange. Troubling. Donald Trump. Got to use his surname as well. Uh, um, um, so Don, Don, Donald Trump, we, the way we, 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 we did it was we said he invited himself to lunch. Um, um, and we said, we'll only do it if it's all on the record. And he, he wanted to come and see the publisher for a private lunch. We said, no, you can't do that. But if, if, you, if you come, this is when he was president-elect, um, you can absolutely have lunch. It's going to be an on-the-record occasion with all of our political editors and correspondents. And we did an hour and a half, essentially, press conference with him. Um, and he answered the questions, I have to say, you know, very openly. Um, in very early days, he didn't, I mean, you know, he, he, he had very general answers to some of the questions, but he, he did, I think, to be fair. I asked him whether he was going to um, defend the First Amendment, defend press freedom, given his attacks on the media, and his promise to harden libel laws. And he, he said, I think you'll be okay. I think you'll be fine, uh, was his answer. 
and, and he then went he, he then went downstairs and said to the world's media that the New York Times was a jewel a jewel for America and the world. <laughs> so sometimes he says nice things about us. Uh, the role of political entertainment uh, TV? I think it's really interesting and complicated. I mean, I, I, you see, I want to say, I completely know what Emma's talking about when she's sort of talking about sort of dump, dumbing down infotainment and, and that, how that can feel kind of pointless and, and selling out. I think satire and humour and ridicule even in the right hands can be one of the most intelligent ways of doing doing um, uh, uh, political journalism. I, I always think, you know, I wrote a book about rhetoric. I think great sar satirists are the best analysers of rhetoric. They do it by making fun of it. They explain the absurdities in what politicians say. So it, I, I think it's a complicated topic, this, because I think at it, at it's also, by the way, fun and ridicule, which can be poisonous and polarising, are also one of the great ways you bring politics to life for many people and kind of get them interested in politics. So I want to say it just all wants to be done creatively and in the end kind of sympathetically, by which I mean it's got to be done in a way which is sort of human and, and not just more poisonous propaganda, basically. So it depends how you do it, I think. And I didn't, didn't, could you repeat that? I didn't quite understand the last was question. A question about the, whether the mainstream media promote uh, mainstream candidates, was it, yeah, in, in the than, elections? Yeah, rather than, like, Bernie Sanders and Trump both have the same... Yeah, no, I, I, and so I think the answer is, I, I think there is something for the mainstream media to consider. Um, in other words, you know, be very careful, I don't particularly think of the New York Times, but, but, you know, I'm not saying it doesn't potentially maybe in the past. I mean, I think we're trying much harder with this very big Democrat field right now in the States to try and be fair to different candidates. Um, I think in the past it was probably too that mainstream media tended to be a bit blinkered. Um, I have to say, though, that I think, you know, outsider insurgents, people who seem to be, um, seem to be very low probability, but who suddenly catch a wave and become real contenders, Bernie Sanders in 2016 being an example of that, Again, the media is sometimes too slow to spot that. I mean, you can't do, I mean, there's 20-something candidates. You can't cover them all fully. You're having to make guesses uh, or judgments about who are the leading ones, and sometimes you get it wrong. And, of course, if you're one of the ones who isn't chosen, you feel it's a terrible injustice. But uh... mm -hmm. Okay. I'm afraid that we have gone... Oh, actually, there was one more. All right, all right. Could you solve? So I, I did. That was the. That was the question yeah. I didn't understand. Actually. Yeah. Uh, my question was: In today's world, with the instant access, of course, of all this media being produced, right? What role do news agencies have? Media outlets have in holding each other accountable? Uh, oh, I, 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 that's a good, it's a, again, it's a good question. It's okay. a very good question, and I, I want to say, I mean, the wonderful thing about running the BBC and running the New York Times is there's never any doubt that the rest of the industry is going to hold us to account. I mean, um, every day the press cuttings alone, and quite, quite apart from the Twitter sphere, uh, we, there's 20 stories at least written every day about the Times. And um, at the BBC, the press cuttings are usually every day two or 300 pages long, two or 300 pages of, of coverage. Um, so obsessive concern for some media outlets. I would say generally, though, not enough. I mean, to some extent, um, I think one of the things that media needs is actually serious criticism in the way you need, you know, critics to judge theatre or opera or dance. You want people who really know what they're talking about judging it. We have some good media columnists in the, in the States and some in the UK. But um, I do worry that allowing the only people who, in quotes, hold media to account are the partisans who are screaming about it. I think that wouldn't be too good either. I'm afraid this is all the time we have for tonight's debate. Uh, also because uh, there is another event actually after after this one and in this very very room. So I would like to yes. apologize to everyone whose questions uh, could not have been heard. And I would like to uh, thank to all the panelists uh, for their very insightful <laughs> remar remarks and comments. And especially once again for uh, uh, to, to Mark Thompson for coming all the way from New York. Uh, he's had a marathon day today, answering uh, several journalists' uh, interviews, and today now uh, many questions from the audience. So thank you very much, to Mark, for coming, for sharing your thoughts. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone, and good night.